just for a few moments, I want to share, I want to just repeat the thought the pastor shared two weeks ago about salvation being the greatest miracle. And so if you have your Bible, I want to read one verse. I back it up with a story from the Bible and then share a few thoughts with you. And I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13. It says the following. Each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yes, yet as through the fire. I want to speak briefly on a small topic that I will title it, The Greatest Miracle. The Greatest Miracle. Word miracle is flippingly used in our church. It's probably used more than you would hear in a typical church in Tri-Cities. Uh, we are the people who love miracles, and we love God who makes them. God cannot answer your prayer without a miracle. And most of us, we have problems that only miracle will be the solution. Where connections, better education, or better connections will not be but the miracle. We've seen, I think every person in here has seen some kind of a miracle in their life. We have those who come to church, we witnessed plenty of them during our prayer line once a month and also in our own personal lives. Some are bigger, some are smaller, but again, miracles are not something that we are complete strangers to. But there is a miracle that's greater than all of these miracles. I want to share today from the story of Lot and Abraham. And we will kind of tie that into the verse that we read right now in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The story of Abraham or the story of Lot, word Lot means veil. Means veil. When you put a veil over you, that's what Lot means. Lot, at the young age, lost his dad. His dad passed away. So he decided to connect himself to his uncle, Abram. Most of us know him as Abraham, but before he was Abram. He connected himself to his uncle, Abram, and he kind of went in as like a son to Abram. Abram on the other hand did not have a son so it was good for Abram to have somebody to kind of be a father to and it was good for Lot to have like a father figure in his life because he did not have a physical father and Lot kind of walked around Abraham all the time he accompanied him everywhere that Abram went and then he started to grow because he surrounded himself with Abram and I wanted to just kind of pause for a moment and just, just drop a little nugget here. And it's not a new thing for all of us here. It's so important to realize you cannot choose your parents, but you can choose your mentors. And many times our life on this earth will be a result of your parents or of your mentors. When you are born first time on this earth, you will never have perfect parents but some people have parents that are not good some people have parents that are absent some people have parents that are abusive some people have parents who are just not supportive some people have parents who are just not there for them who have their own issues and as a result of that your life becomes a result of the kind of parents you have if you look at your life today the reason why you have a nice car, the reason why you have an education, it's somewhat connected or if you don't have these things, it's somewhat connected to the kind of parents that you have because your parents will determine the quality of your life on earth. But there comes a point like Lot that you have to make a, make a decision that if your parents maybe are not there or maybe they are not good in a sense guiding your life, you have to find yourself a mentor and switch so that your life can change even though you don't have good parents that you can have a good mentor who will also affect your life. Somebody say amen. amen. And that's exactly what happened to Lot. Lot started to follow a man who followed God. Lot started to connect himself to an uncle and his life started to get better. He started to get more money. His business started to grow. Things started to change and things started to get a lot better until there was a conflict. 
And you need to know also this. If you have a mentor, you will have a conflict. And when you have a conflict, in the conflict with your mentor, with your parents, you have an option. You either change or your relationship with them changes. So what Lot decided, instead of changing himself, he decided to go ahead and change the relationship so that Lot can remain unchanged. And it's always easier to change a relationship with someone than to change yourself. It's always easier to block them on Facebook, unfollow them from Instagram, unfollow them from Twitter and remove their phone and get a restraining order so they cannot see you 500 feet from you or they get arrested. It's always easier to do that than to humble yourself. It's always easier to change a relationship than to change one's character. And Lot changes the relationship. Lot doesn't break the relationship with his mentor. Lot doesn't say, Abraham, me and you are enemies. No. Lot simply takes a distance from Abraham and says, we just need to have our space. We need to have, a, we need to make some room because we can't be too close. We rub against one another. There's friction. Sparks are flying when we are too close. So we need to take a distance. We're not enemies. We will not kill our relationship. We are just going to take a distance. And this is the problem. Disaster happened in Lot's life. Not when the relationship died. When the relationship went on a distance. And the challenge is this. There's many young people that I meet and you will meet who have a mentor. Oh yes, I know somebody. I actually can show you their phone number. This person I look up to. I do go to church. It's a good news church. And I was like, for the life of me, I don't remember seeing you for the past three years. But that's my church. And what they do is they have a mentor. They have a church. They have a religion. But they are distant from it. And they think that the presence of Abraham on their phone is what's going to bless their life. Not realizing it's the closeness. It's how close you are to your church. How close you are to your leader. How close you are to your home group. That is what guarantees your success in life. It's not even having good parents that's going to bless you. It's how close you are to your good parents. And Lot was distance. Distance breeds disaster. When there is distance in your relationship, there will be a disaster in your relationship. It happened to Lot. It could happen to us. And so we see that Lot, um, he walks away for a little bit. And then we see bad things started to happen in his life. And I just wanted to encourage you in our church, we believe we want to have a big church and the bigger our church gets we want it to get the smallest what does that mean that means that on our weekly services on wednesdays and sundays we wanted to have really big but on our small groups we wanted to get really small the smaller our small groups the better they are people that have six people in the home group are better than people who have eight because the small group's secret is not to be big because if you have 40 people in a small group it's no longer a small group it's a church <laughs> if you have 30 people in the home group nobody can talk guess who's talking you have and you most likely already got a podium and got already your own little touch cards called ministers association of home groups and that is not a home group we already have wednesday night services on sunday mornings our small groups that's why they're called small we wanted to keep them small we wanted to want them to have many small enough so that each person can express their opinion small enough that you can know each person's name their birthday what's happening in their life small enough that you can rub life with them and you can benefit and they can grow because of you small enough amen but also our service is big enough that we can reach our city that we can reach our generation and make an impact for the glory of God somebody say amen. amen and so that is the little introduction to story of Lot Lot finds himself in Sodom in Genesis chapter 19 Lot is in Sodom and God has most of us know that Sodom is one of those cities that is used in the history of Christianity as a standard for wickedness just like most of us when we want to compare somebody to being really evil we use Hitler we're like well he's as bad as or if somebody is wanting to use somebody as good as an example use Mother Teresa you're like well I'm not Mother Teresa or if you're saying something about I'm not Hitler that's exactly what Sodom is to the wicked cities of the world Jesus even used Sodom as a standard of how wicked cities are and this is where Lot lives. 
This is where Lot abides. His family is there, two daughters, his wife, and his two daughters are engaged and this is where he is. And the Bible says, as he is there living and dwelling, two angels approach his city. And these two angels come to spy the city, see the city how it is. And as they are doing that, Lot comes to them and Lot asks them out of curiosity, could you come to my house and spend the night in my house? In this culture, and like in many Palestinian cultures, it is the code of honor that you take a stranger into your house and you treat him with dignity and respect. It was a code that they lived under and Lot, he subscribed to that code. He welcomes a stranger into his house. But I want you to see an incident here because as Lot is welcoming these strangers, they are replying back to him and they're saying, no, we are not coming to your house. We will stay outside because we need to check the city. Thank you for the generous offer. Now, if Lot made that generous offer just to be nice, he would have said, okay. I asked. I requested. You don't want it? It's your choice. Have you ever had somebody offer to pay for dinner? But they didn't want to pay for dinner. They didn't even have a wallet with them. <laughs> have you ever had, when you go out maybe uh, for, for a group meeting and, and the guy says, I want to, yeah, I'll take care of this. But then the girl wants to test that by saying, no, I got it. And then the guy replies, oh, okay, I guess. <laughs> Since you insist, she wasn't insisting. She just said she wanted to test. Do you really want to pay? Or are you just saying it to be nice? I wonder if that's exactly what angels did with Lot. I wonder if they said no just to see. Do you really want us to come to your house? Or are you bluffing? How many times we take no as an indication of this is what God wants or not instead of as a test to what you really want? How many times a no is God's way of saying, I want to bless you. I want to use you, but I want to see how bad do you want it? And that's exactly what messengers are doing. They're saying, no Lot, we're not going to your house. And if Lot would have been like many men in the restaurant, Lot would have been like, praise God. Because I don't even have nothing to eat for you guys. I was just trying to be nice in the first place. I don't even care about you guys. Plus you guys probably some weirdos. I don't even did your background check. I don't know who you are. No, Lot insists. The Bible says he strongly insisted. I want to know, I want you to know one thing about your relationship with Holy Spirit. You have to learn to discern that God's no's are not always an indication of what he wants but a test of what you really want. When we seek the gifts of the Holy Spirit, when we are praying here and saying, God give us an anointing to deliver people from demons. When we are here praying saying, God give us the grace so people out of wheelchairs can walk. Lord give us the grace so we can see not just a thousand but thousands of people being saved and thousands of churches being opened. And maybe you don't see it happening. You don't have to see God's no as an indication of his character. It's a test to how bad do you want it? Are you willing to hold on to it year after year? Are you willing to insist, persist and be consistent with it? Because see, there is no problem with God's desire. The problem is that our desires many times are too weak and too fragile. And God does not give precious gifts to people who are weak in their desires for these things. God did not reveal precious revelations to Daniel just on nothing. The Bible says that when he came to Daniel, he says, Daniel, you're a man of a great desire. The Bible says that Elijah was man just like us. Same passions means he was a man of passion. Let's be a people who don't take God's no as an indication always of God's desire but learn to discern that God's no at times is an indication of God is testing what do you want how bad do you want it when we are praying for souls when we're gathering in our home groups we're getting in a circle and saying Lord God save people and maybe you come next week or you come next month and you begin to see say Lord do you really want to save people because I don't think I see what I'm praying for 
delay is not denial and no does not mean God says no no many times means I want to know how bad do you want it we want it bad you want it bad and that's for you not gonna give up on your miracle and that's for you're not going to give up on your dreams and we're not going to give up on one promise that God gives to us. Why? Because if these angels said no and they went to Lot and God could say no and come to you. If mother of Jesus came to Jesus and says Jesus they don't have wine and Jesus says that's not my time but the mother says Jesus he says okay I got it and he does a miracle. If the mama can do that can you imagine you can do that too some of us were like so fluffy if there is no answer if nothing is happening we're like oh this indicates God does not want to heal people and then we build doctrines based on the fact that there is no but we have to have a lot character and say God I know that I feel like there is no from heaven but your word says yes and I'm gonna hold on to that until I see that as a reality in my life in Jesus name can somebody say amen, amen. and so we learned that relationship with Holy Spirit as the basis that we learn to discern God's no as an indication of God is testing our character to see can I trust you with this is your desire big enough I remember when we were praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, when we came to United States in 2000 year 2000 and in our duplex or Stephen's duplex at the time we were praying for baptism of the Holy Spirit there was a group of maybe 10 or 15 of us who were receiving prayer and and one by one people start getting baptized in the Holy Spirit and I was always that one who was not getting it and I felt so guilty and also felt jealous and felt wrong because I was kind of trying to you know get my life right and trying to preach and I felt like I deserved it more I felt like I needed it more I felt like I'm preaching and this would be a great proof that I'm genuine servant of God because I speak in tongues the issue is that it was not happening all everybody I mean those people who like who were sinners and they were getting it just like this and I would be filled with the Holy Spirit but I could not speak in tongues it just I could not speak I couldn't receive this precious gift and this was also my own problem probably pride and self-righteousness and everything but there is something happened to me that I look back at my past is that when that happened I became a little bit zealous it hit my nerve and I said wait these people got it just like right here and I couldn't get it so I started to pray I heard something about fasting I'm little 14 years of age in Hanford High School during lunch I found a little baseball place where they play baseball I still remember it like yesterday I went to that piece of metal I grabbed it my head to the metal and the only thing I was saying is God give it to me give it to me six months every Wednesday and the more I prayed I was so close but it's just like one small tip and I would, I would be praying so hard and I started to pray after school now because I'm like okay hey, Wednesday nights is not enough we got we Wednesday during the lunch is not enough we got to add a little bit more so after school I would take 10 or 15 minutes lock myself in the room we lived in a pink duplex in Richard so I would lock myself in the balcony and it was this faithful Saturday afternoon it was a day before the anniversary of our church it was the another just time where I came and said God I know I feel like you're saying no I can't receive it but God I want it and I started to be filled with the Holy Spirit but I still didn't speak in tongues and when I would be filled with the Holy Spirit I would forget about the rules of politeness to the neighbors and I'll be praying so loud until I hear neighbors boo 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 and it was on that Saturday afternoon, six months, something came out like a river. And tongues started to just angelic. This is not just like us, you know, sometimes by faith speaking in tongues. But this is things you can't even control. They take over. These are things that for hours are going. It's the grace of God. And that day I learned something. It's as though God on purpose was withholding this precious gift because he knew it's gonna draw me closer and closer and pull something out of my heart that I didn't even know I had. Yeah. Somebody say amen. amen and turn off their phone for the glory of God. <laughs> I 
amen and so I really want us to kind of have that determination not to accept no as an answer but to persevere but to go forward but not to give up because God's grace is going to be revealed in God's time but meanwhile God is going to stretch us and meanwhile God is going to turn off the phone and then return everybody's attention back to the preacher for the glory of God amen amen Lot brings these messengers into his house he insists and they reply they come to the house and when they are in the house he begins to give them food he begins to water begins to wash their feet he gives them a best bed he begins to take care of them he begins to honor them which was very common in that culture and it is common today to practice hospitality as he is doing all of these things something else happens the Bible says there's a knock on the door and the whole men of the city came and they also want to do something to this man but they don't want to be kind to this man the Bible says they want to know this man carnally it means they want to have they can want to commit sin and they want to abuse this man they want to do bad things to this man so here we have the city and here we have a man and here we have these messengers a man who is serving these messengers and the men of the city who are trying to serve their own lust and as a result they will abuse these messengers because Lot wants to serve the messengers they in return protect him and his family because the men of the city want to abuse these messengers the messengers protect themselves by making this man so blind that they'll never see them again Holy Spirit is someone God sent on this earth just like messengers were sent to Sodom Holy Spirit came here on the mission not to give charismatics a goosebumps but to give us a leading to Jesus and bring us closer to heaven Holy Spirit was sent to do miracles so that we he can draw people closer to Jesus and every person on this earth has a relationship with Holy Spirit but not every person has a good relationship to Holy Spirit whether you realize it or not but people who live satisfying their carnal evil fleshly wicked desires they are doing that at the expense of hurting grieving quenching resisting and blaspheming the Holy Spirit but as a Christian when you honor the Holy Spirit he protects you when you treasure the Holy Spirit he will honor you when in return we satisfy our lusts when in return we gratify our carnal nature and this is scary Holy Spirit will protect himself by pushing you away and when he pushes you away and you're without Holy Spirit you will never find a way to heaven when you're blind the Bible says they were weary trying to find the door when people are blind because the way they treat the Holy Spirit and he protects himself by pushing them away from him then people are like those people they're blind walking around trying to find a way they get into this they get into that and until God does a supernatural miracle of removing that blindness these people go to hell not knowing where they're going that's why it's so important as people to always honor the Holy Spirit and he will protect you when we honor our flesh instead of fighting against it Holy Spirit will protect himself at the expense of your ignorance and then your ignorance well it has a self-destructive mode you don't even need Satan after you're blind you destroy yourself and that is not good how does these angels these messengers protect Lot they draw him in and they do a miracle and Lot sees this miracle and man this was incredible because here is Lot for the first time seeing a miracle in front of his eyes how these men with just one gaze could make an army of men 
blind. This was the moment to sit down and say, guys, this is a good time to tell me who you are. What are you from? When did you start to practice this magic power? What is your mission? What is your assignment? Let's start a blind ministry in Sodom. Let's go around make bad people blind. Let's advertise our ministry everywhere. Why? Let's, let's begin this. This is amazing. Let's write a book. Let's post some pictures of blind people searching who were bad and they didn't do anything bad. Let's do something incredible because we have seen a miracle. But these messengers look at Lot and they say all of this miracle that we just did, if you missed the point of all of this that we did, this miracle becomes kind of pointless because if you don't listen to us right now and what we're saying is this is that this city is going to burn in flames and if you don't leave this city this miracle that we protected you from right now will be in pointless because this city will destroy everybody in flames including those we just helped holy spirit does miracles of healing does miracles of blessings does miracles of connecting you to your spouse miracles of asthma disappearing miracles of schizophrenia being gone miracles of even the dead being raised all of these miracles have one simple purpose to bring us to the greatest miracle and the greatest miracle is the salvation of our soul Amen. if we are experiencing a miracle like the house of Lot but we don't get saved imagine what will happen these two daughters who were just protected from enormous abuse by perverted men in less than 12 hours will burn in the flames that will engulf city of Sodom if a person who gets cured of cancer and lives for 20 more years but he is not saved what will really the good will it do to him if he will go to the place of eternal separation without cancer what good does it do to a man who is blind listening to his earphones if you give him a sandwich and you fed him well but he's walking to a cliff will feeding him it's good it make him feel but good but for a moment but in the long term that sandwich is not good for him and if we feel like the Holy Spirit comes to only give people sandwiches who are on their way to a cliff we are wrong if our notion is that Holy Spirit wants to just protect Lot's daughters but in 12 hours they are going to be burned by the flame Holy Spirit cares about bigger things than just that that's why some cases you see God might not be involved in healing someone but he pays more attention to saving somebody else's soul that's why you see Jesus did not get the man off of the cross but he got that man saved why because he knew the way this man's gonna die will matter very little in the eternity but how this man is gonna die now that is gonna be a difference many times people offend about God they say well I don't believe in God because my mother died out of cancer or well, my best friend had in a car accident and a drunk driver hit him where was God in that there's something more important than the events surrounding your death how many of you remember whether you were born through c-section or you were born naturally you do you don't you don't remember not one emotion associated with your birth but it was so painful but it was so hard but you at today you will not be able to recall one second of how you were born when you die it will not matter how you died you will not remember and it will not be important in the eyes of eternity and many people break their faith over the fact how people die instead of focusing their faith of how they live their life I want us to make a decision today miracles are good but even if you don't experience a certain miracle in your life remember the greatest miracle is not getting a sandwich as you're walking to a cliff the greater miracle is that you will let Jesus guide you from the cliff and guide you into heaven it's good to see blind eyes open but if these blind eyes don't see Jesus in heaven listen the Bible says it's better to go to heaven without eyes than to go to hell with them 
the Bible says it's better to go to heaven without a leg and to go with both legs straight into hell it is good to have a miracle when God restores your leg but it's better even if you hop on one leg but you hop to heaven it's better to suffer here and go to heaven than live in riches here and end up in hell I want to challenge you the greatest miracle is not your healing the greatest miracle is not your breakthrough the greatest miracle is not when God supernaturally protects you the greatest miracle is when you can hear God say run from Sodom and you pack your bags and you run from Sodom that is the greatest miracle the reason why we want to see these miracles of blind eyes open deaf ears open the cripple walk is so not so just so we can have our life around that is so we can point to people this is just a sandwich to let you know God loves you so much that he fed you but if you're gonna keep walking in this direction you will fall off the cliff because Sodom is gonna burn because sinners they will go to hell unless we repent because of the grace of God the greatest miracle is being escaped from Sodom it's not being protected by the monsters who knock on your doors because if you are protected from that but you don't leave Sodom in 12 hours these and you men and you will go off in flames and this miracle becomes of no point becomes of no significance I want to encourage each one of us to keep the main focus in our miracles and that is to see people come to Jesus Christ because of these messengers and because of these miracles after that Lot's eyes open and Lot says I'm going with you guys Lot goes off to tell his in-laws and says we need to leave but I want you to notice a few things that were missing in this evangelism the message was there the miracles were not there and the messengers were not there and therefore his in-laws looked at Lot and said you are joking how come Lot never said to the messengers you are joking because there was a message there was messengers and there was miracles and when you have a gospel the Holy Spirit and the power of God people will never respond you are joking they may say we don't want it but they will never have the basis to say you are joking that's why Jesus told to the disciples you wait in Jerusalem I don't want you to go tell the message to the world until you get the messenger the Holy Ghost and I don't want you to go nowhere until you get his miracles because a lot tried to get people out of Sodom with just a message and they looked at him and say you crazy man but you will go into all the parts of the world with the Holy Spirit on your side and it with his power and people who are Greeks people who are Russians people who are Hispanic people who live in China people who live in Siberia they will all listen to that because it's not going to be just a message it's going to be the Holy Spirit and it's going to be his power supporting that and then your mission will become possible our mission is possible not just because we know the message but because also we have the messenger the Holy Spirit and our mission is possible when that message is backed up by a miracle can somebody say amen, amen. I want to encourage us right now the reason why we're reading this book is so that we can get to know Holy Spirit better the reason why we want to get to know the Holy Spirit better is not so we can become spiritual gurus it's not so that we can become spiritual very very deep spiritually it's so that we can be more effective in our mission to bring people to Jesus it's so that we can be more effective that when we tell somebody about Jesus and they say I have a sharp pain in my side and at that moment you say in your mind Holy Spirit please heal their sharp side so that when I say Holy Spirit healed you but you need to give your life to him my words will have volume yeah. and you lay your hands on their sharp side and you command that pain to go and when you lift that hand so did the pain left then your words have volume yeah. your words will not seem joking when you will say that there is heaven and there is hell and you need to give your life to Jesus Christ I want us to rise up today in our faith I want us to strengthen our position in God today to realize with Holy Spirit we will evangelize and with Holy Spirit we will have miracles without the Holy Spirit's presence and his miracle power our evangelism will fall on empty ears and it's not going to make a difference amen in conclusion 
I want to mention one thing that Lot did not have the opportunity to do that we do today. When Lot left Sodom, Lot left Sodom. But he could not take his house with him. He could not take his sheep, oxen, donkeys. He could not take nothing with him. He had to leave everything behind. He did not have time to sell anything to take with him. And I want you to remember this. If we are not prepared to leave this earth, we are not fully equipped to live on this earth. Lot lived every year in Sodom to live in Sodom. Lot did not live in Sodom to leave Sodom. But one day when he had to leave, he realized, I'm not prepared for it. Most of the people on this earth drink 26 vitamins, go to the gym three times a day, three times a week. They try to exercise, they try to eat healthy, they try to sleep at night and eat a fat, good breakfast. They try to go to the doctors, you know, every few months just for a regular checkup. And we have 401k, we have retirement funds, we have all of these things. Why? So that we can make our roots go a little bit deeper into this Sodom. Because our goal is, th is this, we want to live good. But as a lot, you must understand, your secret is you want to leave good. Amen. You want to build your life in such a way, not to live, but to leave. And when you build your life to leave, then you can live without regret in the eyes of eternity. Because if we live our life only for now and here and we will go into eternity, we will look back and we will have sadness and regret. But when we live our life saying that I build my life to leave, we will look back from the eternity and say, man, this was great. You know, I, I, I'm so happy for Lot that he escaped the city. But he escaped alone. He escaped without anything. If Lot would have had this message, you know what Lot would have done? He would have put his property for sale. He would have gotten the money in his pocket. He would have sold every sheep. He would have sold everything that he had there. So when he would leave Sodom, he would leave with money in his pocket instead of money going in flames. Imagine 20 years of your life building a house that will burn in flames. But what would you do if you knew you would have to leave on a short notice? You would sell things, you would do things and people would look at you and say, why are you selling things? Ah, I'm preparing to leave. You guys are going to live. I am going to leave. And the statistic says 10 out of 10 people will leave Sodom. You will leave and I will leave. Most of us will leave to heaven just like the people we read in 1 Corinthians. They will be saved but as through the fire. It means the only thing that will be saved is their soul. But we want to live today in such a way that our car is saved, our house is saved, our time is saved, everything is saved. You may say, how can I save my car? When you use your car, as a vehicle to bring people to God. How can you save your house when your house is used to bring people, home groups, evangelism, you feed people, you bring people, you bring people who don't know Jesus and you use your house for the purpose of God. How can you save your time? The Bible says redeem your time. When your time is not only for school, work and sleep, but your time is also to meet with people, evangelize, disciple people and then you're leaving this earth and your pockets are full with stuff. You're not leaving nothing behind. Why? Because you lived your life for the day you leave, not for the day you can live. It's like that, it's like the one man who went to heaven and he looked in heaven, he saw his house and he said, wow, this is, this is a shack. And the angel looked at him and he says, we did the best with what you sent with us. He said, whatever you sent to us, that's what we did the best to build it. You know, we all will go to heaven as Christians, but in heaven there will be different rewards. Bonus package is that you're in heaven, but in heaven there's different rewards. And so many Christians say this, well I'm saved and I want to be saved like the criminal on the cross. I want to live my life destroying myself. I want to live my life doing all of these things that I want to do. And right before I die, I want to see God just give me the chance to accept Jesus in my heart. First of all, you're not guaranteed of that. But let's say that happens. Do you really want to be the person like Lot who left this earth and have everything engulfed in flames? It's amazing how you don't apply the same theory to work. You don't leave the school and say, I just want to get a job. I don't care how much it pays. 
you go to school why because you want a job that pays a little bit more than minimum the people who have mansions in tri-cities you know why have they have mansions not because they live in tri-cities and not because they finished high school it's because they worked for a mansion we all christians claiming i'm gonna have a mansion in heaven but you're working for yourself mansion from what well what god said mansion that's like saying i'm gonna come to america and have a mansion no you will come to america and have welfare but not a mansion it's good you will have a blessing a transit good roads and everything but to have a mansion you gotta do a little bit more than just come to america somebody say amen and so we have to have a little bit more than just like i'm gonna live my life my house my money i don't have time for prayer i don't have time for evangelism i don't have time for these things well i'm so busy but oh in heaven i'm gonna have a mansion where did you get that from because the people jesus said that to are the people who were beheaded people who were crucified upside down these are the people who left their boats people who left their businesses and left everything and followed him these are the people this promise was given not to somebody who lives their life for themselves and put themselves in the center of the world and has this illusion i am gonna have a mansion probably a mansion but i don't think it's gonna be made out of things that you want to be made of i'm not saying in any way you're gonna live in some kind of a shack part of heaven please understand what i'm trying to say is that heaven will have reward and you have to live your life as a christian for that what i'm saying is that when you don't leave this earth empty don't leave everything behind like one of the wealthiest men who died and one of his friends said so how much did he leave when he died and the friend replied back to him he said he left everything don't be like that sometimes we need to sell things to give to people other times we need to make time during our schedule to go bring people to jesus use our car not only to drive around pasco or kenwick put your little cool glasses and throw the little cool music but use your car to bring people to church use your time use your house use everything why because you are going to leave this earth and you gotta get ready for it today why am i saying this because holy spirit gives us power for evangelism eternity gives us motivation for evangelism we don't evangelize so we can grow a church we evangelize because there is heaven and there is hell we evangelize because we want to live our life that will make sense in the light of eternity Anytime you tell people about Jesus and your only deal is accept Jesus, He will make your life better. We don't say that. We say accept Jesus because He's the only Savior for your soul. If you're flying in the airplane and uh, the captain takes a microphone and says that I want everybody to put the parachute on. Most of you who ever jumped out of the plane, you understand that parachutes are not the most comfortable coat that you can wear. And if you have a parachute on, you're not going to be comfortable. And you're going to quickly remove the parachute and say, I don't need this parachute. This is not giving me comfort. And the, the pilot lied when he said that the comfort, this will bring me comfort. Sometimes the parachute won't bring you comfort. But when a pilot will say that the engine died and the second engine is about to die and our plane will, is about to explode, you are going to put that parachute on and you won't care about your comfort a bit. Amen. When we only tell people that you need to accept Jesus so that your life can get better, there are people in Tri-Cities who will tell you, actually my life is better than yours. Maybe you should abandon Jesus because in the first century when people accept Jesus they would lose their job, lose their family and sometimes lose their life. Why would they still accept Jesus? Because the engine in the airplane is dying and the plane is about to get exploded and there is hell and it's hot and there is heaven that is good and life is too short to gamble with life. And they knew that on earth pain and suffering is the closest thing I come to hell but if somebody doesn't serve God joy and fun and pleasure and money is the closest thing they get to heaven. And they said, you know what, I'll rather walk in suffering here but enjoy eternity there than enjoy things here and suffer eternity there. I want to challenge you today. Eternity is the greatest motivation for evangelism. Holy Spirit is the greatest empowerment for evangelism. His miracles are the greatest empowerment for the greatest miracle. That is the salvation of people's souls.